ओके वी आर एन इंटरेस्टिंग स्पीशीज एंड इंटरेस्टिंग मिक्स वी आर केपेबल ऑफ सच ब्यूटिफुल ड्रीम्स एंड सच हॉरेबल नाइट मेयर्स यू फील सो लॉस्ट एंड सो कट ऑफ सो अलोन only the fact that we are not alone because in all of our searching the only thing we have found that makes this emptiness bearable is each other some wise words from carl sagan a very very good morning to all our senior dignitaries faculty members and students joining us from india and warm greetings to all of those joining us from around the world it gives me immense pleasure to receive you all towards our inaugural session for introduction to astrobiology the online course that is being run by the center of excellence in astrobiology at amity university mumbai we are honored to have with us visionaries who have closely followed the developments in astrobiology around the world and have, and have fostered the establishment of our new center here in india i am honored to introduce dr asim chohan ji dr chohan is a founding trustee of the amity education group and additional president of the ritnan balved education foundation he is also the chairman of our astrobiology center and and uh, and he serves as the chancellor of several universities in india of amity in rajasthan haryana mumbai uttar pradesh uh, chatisgarh and others we also have with us uh, dr selvam murthy sir who is presently working in the capacity as a president of amity science technology and innovation foundation dr selvam murthy has uh, he, he also serves as the uh, director general for amity directorate of science and innovation he has uh, uh, he has served for 40 years at the defense research development organization here in india and he retired as the chief controller r&d in life sciences and international cooperation i am fondly led and uh, and given a lot of support by our honorable vice chancellor sir lieutenant general vk sharma who joins us from gwalior who is also the vice chancellor of amity university madhya pradesh with these very words i would like to welcome all of you to our course and let me just show you a few slides before which we can quickly jump into our um, our welcome notes from each of our leadership members and we will introduce you to our chief guest for today as well so very warm welcome to everybody here in uh, in india i am delighted to have you all with us now this covid time has brought around very unusual but also special circumstances we have tried our level best here at amity to ensure that we are able to reach out to students not just in india but in fact around the world we took it upon ourselves with a lot of support from our partners at uh, nasa astrobiology uh, blue marble space institute of science mars society australia open university of uk and we put together a small curriculum and converted that in the form of a series of webinars that will be running from this weekend all the way until the 25th of october and the purpose here is to address the knowledge gap that exists in astrobiology research astrobiology being a new and upcoming field around the world as well as here in india there is not many education opportunities that exist for students outside of a few countries and we have taken it upon ourselves to initiate the students from science and engineering and other disciplines into getting inspired and motivated and find some direction towards applying their fundamental knowledge and specializing in the field of astrobiology research we were very fortunate to be promoted by several organizations around the world and as a product of that within 10 days of opening our registration we were able to get about 795 participants sign up from 53 different countries six different continents and with a perfect mix of gender balance as well we are very very proud of achieving that and there are people from all of these different countries from different disciplines and education levels that ended up signing up for it as soon as that happened we realized the immense responsibility that has fallen upon our shoulders and towards that we wanted to ensure that these are just not lectures that we are delivering but rather an engaging and interactive session by which we can actually measure the ability of the students to grasp these topics and to do that we came up with a course that was easy to handle for everybody and was engaging enough and we had certain assessment tasks that were associated with it as well we just put together a small infographic uh, this was a small exercise that the participants undertook even before the course started 
So this is to show you how excited and motivated everybody was. We had our first orientation two weeks back and we gave them a task that how would you call astrobiology, the study of the origin, evolution and distribution of life, how would you do that in your own language? And we had 36 languages and out of them 24 different languages of, of, of people just to show a diversity of, of who we are. I'm also very, very uh, fortunate to receive the class instructors, some of us, uh, some of those who are with us today online, Dr. Jennifer Blank, uh, Dr. Afshin Khan, Dr. Michael Macy from UK, uh, Dr. Alisa from Harvard Law School, and of course our guest speaker, Dr. Jonathan Clark, uh, who will be talking to us today. I will not go into further details. I think everybody has seen the, the timetable that we have. We have set ourselves for a very exciting course of journey in astrobiology with topics covering from uh, solar system, microbiology, the different missions and planets around us, and also a class on the human aspects of astrobiology. And there are several students who are with me today. So without further ado, I will now pass on um, uh, the, uh, the welcome note to our respected uh, Vice Chancellor, Sir, Lieutenant General VK Sharma. Uh, sir, can we please have you? And if you could share with us uh, a few notes of uh, encouragement, Sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Siddharth Pandey. Uh, Dr. Asim Chauhanji, the president of MIT University of Mumbai and the additional president of RBEF, which is the mother funding body of all MIT institutions in India and abroad. Dr. W. Silvamurthy, Dr. P. Shrikumar, Dr. Jonathan Clark, Dr. Michael Messi, Dr. Afshin Khan, and Dr. Anilia Betty. The topic itself, which has been chosen by the students to undertake a short seven, seven lectures introduction to astrobiology certification program is unique in its kind. Astrobiology is a branch which tries to explore the possibility of existence of life on other planets or on external outside the solar system, within the solar system, how does it exist? The universe itself is believed to be about 13 billion years old. The solar system is about 5 billion years old, and the Earth itself is about 4.5 billion years old. It is believed that the life originated on planet Earth around 4 billion years ago. But the life in the human form, or as we see humans today, is only about 2 lakh years old. And some of our seers believe that life actually exists everywhere. There was one saint in India who mentioned, who says life does not exist on sun? When somebody told him that nothing can exist on sun because of such high temperatures, he mentioned, well, life is always formed from the ingredients of the place where you stay. Like our bodies are believed to be made of all ingredients which are available on planet Earth. He says, how do you know that the solar beings who live on the sun, their bodies are not made of fire? How can you discount that? I was left spellbound when I heard this conversation from a very reputed person. So to that extent, to believe that life exists and consciousness exists in the form of mass consciousness, which is available in the planets, in the solar system, in the galaxies, it does exist. That is what is believed as our as our Hindu scriptures. Coming to astrobiology itself, the art and science and philosophy is so deep and so intriguing. And the limit of human knowledge, we want to break that. We want to go beyond the frontiers of human knowledge 
to explore what is available and where we can reach. So it's such a wide field, which has got unlimited proportions to explore, unlimited knowledge, and some grounds, a lot of ground which can be covered. And the quest for knowledge is there in all human beings by nature. So I extend a hearty welcome to all the participants who have volunteered to join this seven lectures program, which are all on Sundays. And it will give you an excellent insight and motivate you further to take up studies in this field. Soon we will be launching programs with more depth and with greater focus on the subject. So I wish the program a grand success and all the very best, Jai Hind. Thank you very much, Jayan uh, Sharma, sir. I will now request our very dear Dr. Selvamuthi, sir, to please come forward. Dr. Selvamuthi has vast experience. I've already introduced him to everybody, but uh, I'll show thank I, you. Thank I, you, I Dr. Siddharth. Yes, sir. Very good morning yes, and good afternoon, good evening to all the viewers who have joined us from across the globe. And uh, let me convey uh, the greetings and best wishes from our founder president, Dr. Ashoke Chauhan, who has built this Amity universe and who is giving a great impetus to research, innovation in all Amity institutions. He, he wants Amity to contribute to the innovation in a big way at the global level. So today, when I see all this brilliant uh, panelists, the resource speakers, and also the guest speakers, I'm delighted to see that it, you are all going to contribute to this big mission of contributing to society development through research and innovation. I must also compliment Dr. Asim Chauhanji, and uh, he, is, he is creating the uh, Abiti universe in a big way, not only in India, but also across the globe by establishing new universities in various countries. And also he, he is very passionate about research and innovation. Wherever he, he, is, he goes to the university, he talks to the scientists, the faculties, and promotes, he encourages, motivates, motivates, inspires all the faculties and the scientists to contribute their best. So thank you very much, Dr. Simji, for this new initiative at one of your campuses, Summit University, Mumbai where uh, this uh, new center and new activity, Center of Excellence in Astrobiology, you have established. So such a new initiative you have established in many campuses complement you for this yet another initiative. And General Sharma has been with us almost for a decade now. And he is also looking after Amity University, Madhya Pradesh in Gwalior. And he has served the armed forces for almost four decades. And we, we are fortunate to have him uh, as an academician who has also given the academic input when he was in services, armed forces. And thank you very much, uh, Sharmaji, and also to take taking care of the summit University of Mumbai at this period. My compliments to Dr. Siddharth Pandey, is a young, brilliant uh, scientist in the field of astrobiology, very passionate, and also always with zeal, enthusiasm, bubbling with uh, new initiatives, Compliments to you, Dr. Siddharth, uh, for your connectivity with all these brilliant young minds, uh, the great minds across the globe in the field of space, science and technology, as well as in astrobiology in particular. So I continue to do this, and uh, I hope this center, which you are taking as a, champ, as a, a head of this institution, of the Center of Excellence for Astrobiology, to take newer pinnacles uh, in India and across the globe. And I must also express my gratitude to all the guest speakers, particularly Dr. P. Srikumar, who is one of our outstanding scientists in India in the field of space science and technology. And his signature is there for in every program of space science and technology, ISRO program, Indian Space Research Organization, not only in technology development, the governance, the lunar mission, the Mars mission, whichever accomplishments you see here today in ISRO, his signature is there during the last four decades. And he is now the distinguished Vigram Sarabhai and our Satish, Satish Dhawan, uh, the uh, uh, professor over there. And also I, I thank the president of Mars Society Australia, Dr. Jonathan, Jonathan Clark, and also the research scientists from NASA, 
Dr. Jennifer Blank and Dr. also Michael Maxi, Maxi we will be joining and also Afshin Khan and also Dr. Bechi from Mars Society. We express our gratitudes for partnering with us and we really want to expand, deepen our relationship with you, not only from Amitya University Mumbai, but from other campuses as well. And uh, so we look forward to a very deep engagement with you in the next few decades. And this course, which you have started in astrobiology, is the future. 21st century is going to throw up some great excitement in space science and technology. Astrobiology is going to receive a great focus. So it's very thoughtful that uh, uh, Dr. Siddharth, with your initiative, with the support of uh, Dr. Sim Chauhanji, Amity University Mumbai, is able to start this new course, which you have started as the first step. And you have also taken many initiatives to uh, make the Mars, the analog uh, center in Ladakh, which is there in 4,000 uh, meters altitude. And that's also, we have to now uh, do a lot of work over there. And if you look at Indian space program, we are very satisfied and also we are happy that it is emerging as one of the leadership role in across the globe. When you look at the launch vehicle, SLV, ASLV, PSLV, GSLV, and the satellite building, and also technology development, like cryogenic, many, many technologies, because you are in propulsion, control, guidance, navigation, payload integration, separation, computation, all this tremendous strength India has developed through ISRO, Indian Space Research Organization. And they're also partnering with a large number of academic institutions, including Amity universities. And so this is very great that uh, we have such a great organization and who have now gone into Mars mission cost effectively, the lunar mission, and now they are looking at Venus and many other planetary, uh, the uh, interstellar journey they are looking at. So this program is very, very important to build the human resource because we want to build a large number of people will be required in India and across the globe. So that is why Amity being an academic research driven institutions, we are now giving a focus to develop that well equipped human resource, the future global citizens who will contribute to space, science and technology, astrobiology and other fields. So this is very important. And the manned space mission is also on the cards, Gaganyan, maybe in a couple of years, we will be having that dream realized that putting a man from India into space and that's also ISRO mission. And now Amity, we have established not only Amity Space Institute of Space Science and Technology and in, in a few campuses, developing, churning out the human resource and experts in the field, future experts. And we have also established a ground station at Dubai, Amity Dubai. We have established a ground station to receive the communications from uh, the existing satellites. Similarly, Amity News to Chhattisgarh, we have established another station of ISRO to receive how does the atmospheric changes, troposphere, stratosphere, those changes, how will it affect the data transmission from satellite to the ground station? So there is another program sponsored by ISRO is, is with us. We are now developing a CubeSat. We want to put our Amity satellite uh, again from Amity Dubai and Amity University Naida working together. And then the latest one is the first payload biological payload is going to come from Amity University Mumbai, from Dr. Siddharth. We are, we are going to put a callus of a plant into the payload, which is going to the space. So such great things are happening. And we have a strong astronomy and astrophysics group looking at the interstellar chemistry and molecular chemistry to look at the distance between the planets. So we are looking at that. When we are looking at that, we are also looking at the biological life in other plants. That's where the astrobiology comes in a big way. And the Mars Analog Station is a very important initiative. And this particular course is a seven weekly one hour course where all of you are going to contribute thanks to all the speakers. And we are also, uh, and this comprehensive program, uh, Siddharth just worked out to looking at the habita habitability of the planets. You know, how do you live there? Then the rise of life, the, how is the origin of life is another important thing. building the building blocks of life in space. And then exploring life in our solar systems, particularly solar, because galaxy is huge, universe is huge. And the planetary protection and space policy, uh, policy very important. 
life in Mars, particularly, because we are now reaching close to uh, habitability over there, and research and teaching opportunities for the youngsters who are aspiring to be the astrobiologists. So this is very well thought of. Now, finally, the message is the space science, we want to give a new paradigm. We want to contribute to give a new paradigm to astrobiology. And uh, so the government and private players uh, are also now coming in a big way in our country. ISRO is taking to build not only academic partnership, but industries already they have partnership, but then privatization is also coming in a big way in ISRO. And uh, so I'm sure Dr. P. Sri Kumar will mention all this, but let this be a platform to integrate ourselves, network with each other for a sustainable connectivity for decades to come or generations to come. So with this, again, once again, thank all the participants who have joined us in this program, particularly the students and the young budding space scientists and astrobiologists. You have a bright future. So this course is going to be very important. We are going to start undergraduate, postgraduate, doctoral program. So this is just the beginning, a few steps which we are making in that direction. So I'm sure all of you would join us in those the programs to come. So with this, I, I thank you very much for this opportunity to share some thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Siddharth. Thank you, Dr. Asimji. And also thank you, uh, General Sharma. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Selvamoti, sir, for those very enlightening and inspiring words and the brilliant way in which you have given the complete perspective uh, in which we are setting up this uh, center. I will now take the opportunity to introduce you all to our chief guest who will be giving us the inaugural address. But before that, I actually wanted to convey a word of thanks to ISRO and specifically the Space Science Program Office, who have actually been in close contact uh, over emails and messages with us and uh, helped us uh, kind of identify, you know, what are the requirements that we should really be focusing on within astrobiology. Towards this, we had prepared, we had led the preparation in collaboration with several other astrobiology research groups in India, a small document, which was the Astrobiology Roadmap of India document that has been submitted to the uh, Space Science Program Office. So thank you very much to members, uh, specifically Dr. Shama Narendranath at ISRO, who has been guiding us in uh, you know, putting those, uh, this uh, document together. Uh, with this, I will now read out a, a short uh, but illustrious uh, biography of Dr. Parmesh uh, Shikumar. Uh, he is an astrophysicist by training and currently serves as a distinguished Satish Tavan professor at ISRO headquarters. He recently superannuated as the director of Space Science Program Office at ISRO. He was also the director of the Indian Institute of Astrophysics in Bangalore, and he currently holds the advisory position to, at ISRO. After his BSc from University of Kerala and MSc Physics from IIT Bombay, he completed his PhD at University of Hampshire and postdoctoral work on gamma ray observations using the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory spacecraft. After a decade at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, he returned to work in India for ISRO Dr. Shikumar has been instrumental in the efforts towards development of a space science roadmap and has, like Dr. Selvamunti rightly pointed out, a signature in most of the space science missions that ISRO has embarked upon. He served as a principal investigator on the Chandrayaan-1 mission, India's first mission to the moon, as well as for the AstroSat mission. Dr. Shikumar has a broad uh, and widening range in, uh, of interest in research from gamma ray studies, X-ray studies from cosmic sources, composition of sun's corona, mapping of chemicals on the lunar surface, as well as design of X-ray mirrors for future space use. With this, I warmly welcome Dr. Shikumar with us and over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Siddharth. Thank you, uh, Dr. Selvamurthy, as well as the Chancellor and the Vice Chancellor of uh, Amity University. It's a pleasure to be part of this program today. Uh, as you, uh, as Dr. Selvamurthy really uh, uh, discussed the broad range of activities uh, both what Amity has and what uh, ISRO is having in the near future and how education institutions and universities like Amity would be become would soon be closer partners in many of these exercises that we are undertaking. Today's uh, program, which is uh, very unique because of the fact that uh, uh, you're discussing an area of research that is really emerging only in India. I mean, until now we've been actually working quite closely in the space science area, primarily in three broad areas, looking at the sun, uh, looking at uh, and solar system, planetary exploration and astronomy. And of course, Earth as a, as a system where uh, we have been very much interested in understanding atmospheres, understanding the effect of the sun on Earth's atmosphere and so on. 
for the planetary exploration program, which began about a decade ago with our first mission to moon and currently with the second mission to moon, uh, has matured to a point of actually bringing a lot of interest and enthusiasm in understanding our solar system, its origin and evolution, uh, influence of the sun on uh, planetary bodies, uh, airless as well as those with atmospheres. And as astronomy uh, uh, further uh, expanded in the last 25 years with the discovery of exoplanets, uh, the search for uh, uh, possible evidence of biological uh, um, uh, biological molecules in uh, atmospheres of other, other exoplanets have really become viable given the high resolution spectroscopy capabilities that are emerging. So one, one of the interesting things we now see is the fact that we are now able to combine the studies that we do of the sun in terms of its uh, short-term behavior when the sun uh, undergoes, uh, provides uh, 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 interesting events within the, in the form of flares, in the form of coronal mass ejections, um, solar energetic particle events, and so on, uh, as well as uh, long-term behavior in terms of how it changes its uh, luminosity, and not luminosity, in terms of the, in terms of the uh, variation in terms of the, both the uh, radio emission as well as an ultraviolet. Weak, but however, significant changes in uh, the radiance and that influences Earth's atmosphere. And we believe that influences other atmospheres of Venus and Mars as well. Now, it is important in the context of uh, these uh, points that I just now mentioned, that is the, the, the search for life elsewhere and the discovery of exoplanets uh, uh, naturally leads to the question about uh, maybe life 2.0. And to really address these questions, we really need to start with astrobiology research in our own solar system. And I think um, that effort, uh, though we have initiated planetary programs, uh, is a little hard to do from an orbital platform. Um, and so that will require actual surface experiments. And these surface experiments are not technically very challenging. Um, we have to really surface, uh, make them move around autonomously, uh, have experiments that can survive the rigor of both launch as well as landing and uh, the extreme conditions of pressure uh, uh, as well as uh, temperatures and power, which are all critical issues. That we need to address. Now, in India, exoplanet studies have largely been with uh, astronomy telescopes, uh, looking at uh, transit methods, looking at radio velocity uh, techniques. But uh, clearly, uh, a, a, an important question as we're looking at future programs is, is, uh, is a case of a large experiment that has been initiated by the Indian Institute of Space, Science and Technology to look for, uh, um, look for um, spectroscopic absorption features in the atmospheres of planets going around stars. And so, the, this sort of a discussion on astrobiology is quite appropriate and opportune in the sense that this is the time when we really need to bring our larger science and technology community uh, up to speed with regard to readiness for programs that we are trying to chart out for the future. So I think uh, this initiative of, uh, of uh, Amiti is indeed most interesting and most appropriate. Um, we've had uh, discussions with Dr. Siddharth and others in, uh, as we are looking at possible roadmaps. Um, however, I, you know, these are non-trivial because of the fact that uh, um, we really have to end the emerging uh, scenario of uh, budgetary limitations as well as uh, emerging expansion of many of these areas of other areas of space science as well. It's very important to really chart out those areas that are most appropriate for us to uh, pursue in the near term within the funding limitation that we currently have. And astrobiology certainly has gotten a new spurt of uh, with the fact that India is also now considering a human uh, uh, human space program, as Dr. Salman mentioned, the Gaganyan program. And naturally, uh, astrobiology and related uh, research becomes very important, both from an application perspective as from a pure science perspective. And so I think this is a very opportune time and it's very impressive and very, we are very glad to see initiatives like this happening at MIT. Pune University has a similar program. And in our view, this would really be a valuable uh, start and a contribution to ISRO in its search for 
uh, the larger user base, the, the greater contribution we anticipate coming from both uh, academic institutions, public and private. And I think MIT has taken an important role in pursuing this. So as we begin this program, and it's uh, wonderful to see this is a program uh, stretched over a short period of time with experts from around the world, all contributing to this program, very, very nice thing to do. But I would really would like to urge you that we slowly build up the, the, the level of the program, the quality of the program, uh, such that we actually certainly bring it up to speed with regard to uh, research components and, uh, and then work very closely with ISRO and other agencies to really try and do some of these uh, experimentation uh, from space platforms, microgravity to actually low gravity conditions on other systems and so on. Finally, just before closing, I just want to emphasize the fact that, you know, we've been looking at, uh, as we expand our planetary exploration program, we've been looking at Venus as a very important uh, planet, um, not just because it's habitable necessarily because of the ex extreme pressures of 100 bar and, uh, and uh, temperatures of, you know, 750 degrees uh, Kelvin is not the best place to be on the surface, but nevertheless, uh, it has indeed uh, suitable environments in its atmosphere uh, 60 kilometers above, which one would really love to really bring back a sample of air, uh, which may be very interesting to us, you know, is the, on, the, on the larger question of panspermia or the question of whether life exists elsewhere in our solar system. And in, in that search, which is now going on in Mars, a similar approach to really explore such things in Venus is something that we would you know, want to pursue in the long run. So this program, which we have now scheduled uh, originally for 2023, but now uh, given a lot of delays with the current uh, pandemic, uh, we may be shifting to a later launch time frame. but clearly an important thing. And uh, if there are avenues to pursue uh, the uh, astrobiology experiments on it, uh, if not now, at least in future missions, that would be a very important thing that we should look forward to. So let me just uh, close by uh, certainly complimenting Amnesty University the high management that has been very supportive. Dr. Siddharth, who has been actually driving this program quite a bit. And I see that he's also very much in touch with a larger community of uh, colleagues at ISR Pune and uh, other institutes in the country that are also exploring uh, programs in astrobi astrobiology. And we hope to work with this uh, academic community in, in taking uh, this research component under space sciences, this newly emerging component of space sciences to uh, to the goals that we are really laying out for. So thank you and let me wish uh, the very best. And I hope uh, the students uh, who are going to be enriched from this program, uh, at least some of them would really be part of our uh, long-term program in the country as the years emerge. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Srikumar. It is actually quite a moving moment for us to reach this stage, to receive these words of wisdom and guidance uh, you know, from the high offices of, of ISRO. Uh, but also, uh, you know, what we are trying to do here is democratize the entire process of astrobiology, uh, you know, nurturing students, but at the same time proposing research, small research projects that can be conducted in low earth orbit and within the current capacities of ISRO and seeing ways in which we can develop the technologies that would be useful one day uh, on Mars or other astrobiology targets. Thank you very much uh, for your very kind words. Uh, with this, I would like to uh, you know, uh, bring forward Dr. Asim Chauhan. So please do join us. You have, you have been the guiding light and vision for us here at Amity. Uh, we, we await to hear more from you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Siddharth. It is really wonderful to be here. And at the outset, let me welcome all the students who are online, who have uh, signed up and are participating in this very exciting certificate program, Introduction to Astrobiology. I was thinking, what kind of people are these that are so forward-looking, so visionary to attend a program over seven days to learn more about this emergent field? So from all over the world, 800, almost 800 students across 53 countries, I think this is remarkable. It is a sign of our times. We live in a time where the problem of our worlds don't seem enough. We are looking beyond to new frontiers and there is momentum like never before to explore the universe. We see initiatives uh, from amazing agencies like our own ISRO, which is the pride of India. And uh, when I was hearing the words of Dr. Shrikumar, the distinguished Satish Dhawan professor at ISRO, 
I truly was reminded by the excellence and the achievements of ISRO and what all ISRO has done, not only to complete a number of major initiatives, but also to inspire and motivate others to think about the possibilities that may be beyond the normal. So Dr. Shrikumar, we are very grateful to you. This is uh, an amazing program and any program is only as good as those who are going to teach it and facilitate it. And we really have an incredible set of faculty and uh, supporters for the program. Uh, so Dr. Jonathan Clark uh, from the Mars Society Australia. So wonderful to have you online, Dr. Clark. I was reading about you and your accomplishments and your vision in this area is something that we are look, very much looking forward to hearing more about today. Uh, Dr. Michael Macy, Dr. Afshin Khan, uh, Ms. Analia Beatty, Dr. Jennifer Blank, who looks today as if she's on the moon, Dr. Blank, I love your background. Um, and the many other people, including all colleagues at MSA, Mars Society Australia, um, Astrobiology at NASA, the Open University and Blue Marble Space. Really my gratitude goes out to you because without the right collaborations, without the right partnerships, we cannot achieve at the maximum potential of what is possible. But when we join hands, when we collaborate, when we share a common dream, then it does sometimes feel that anything is possible and that we can do much more. So my thanks to all of you who have supported Siddharth, who have guided him, helped him, please continue that. And Dr. Siddharth Pandey, you are an amazing young man. Uh, we speak often and I am always uh, moved by your enthusiasm. Sometimes I tell you, if it does not work, don't worry, you're doing a good job. But uh, for this program, the number of students that have signed up is very encouraging. It's encouraging for the program uh, that we have at the university, for the research initiative that we are starting and this small biological experiment that uh, was to go up into space but because of various uh, current pandemic situations has been delayed, but I'm sure will go up, I think is also a hallmark in innovation and trying to figure out more of what happens to biological systems in different space environments. So I'm looking forward to that launch very soon. Dr. Selvamurthy, I, as always, was very happy to hear your words. You're a great visionary in science and technology. I always say one of the top scientists of the country, and we are so happy that you are working with such zeal to bring Amity to the frontiers of science, technology, research, and innovation, uh, like we were pioneers in beginning academic um, endeavors in areas like nanotechnology. We were the first to really begin an academic program uh, in the country, as well as areas like forensic science and cyber law and uh, renewable energy and organic agriculture. Similarly, Dr. Selvamurthy, I think you will agree that the area of astrobiology is also one that we should put a lot of emphasis on because not only will it help enable activities and programs that relate to space exploration, planetary exploration, but a lot of spin-off technologies I think will also be useful in other areas of healthcare science and medicine, which I think could also be very useful. So uh, Siddharth, my Congratulations to you, my blessings to you, my gratitude to all the people online. We at Amity are very committed to this particular area. We will look at your continued support. Many of the students online, please be in touch with us beyond the seven day program. Uh, we will look to develop a network of astrobiology around the world of those who are interested and those who are experts. And we look forward to your continued association. And Dr. Shrikumar, one more time, my gratitude to you your having come online and given your blessings and words is very encouraging for us. And I will speak to you separately also what more we can do as per you in this area. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Asim Chauhan Sirji. Uh, your wisdom, your guidance has led to all of this happening. None of this would have been possible if we were not given the right vision, direction and uh, support. So we are always here and we will make sure that this course is going to be the, this already is the largest astrobiology class ever. I have confirmed that. So we've already hit a milestone and we're only going to go upwards and onwards from here. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you for your valuable time. Uh, a very, very uh, uh, sincere gratitude to all the dignitaries who have joined us today morning. Uh, 
at relatively short notice. Uh, I, we, we do not take any of this for granted. We think your time is extremely valuable and you're with us throughout. Um, with this, um, I am now very, very delighted to kick, kick off our first class of astrobiology uh, that will be delivered by Dr. Jonathan Clark. Um, uh, we would really be delighted if the dignitaries can be with us, but please, uh, under no circumstances, feel uh, obliged. You've, you've given us a lot of your valuable time. Dr. Jonathan Clark, um, I will read out a short um, bio for you as well, and then I would request you to please come forward and uh, share your screen. So Dr. Jonathan Clark lives in Canberra, Australia, is a senior astrobiologist and Mars geoscientist. He calls himself a Mars general practitioner. Dr. Clark, in fact, has been instrumental in mentoring the establishment of Mars analog research in Ladakh in collaboration with other astrobiologists here in India. And he has supported Amity University since 2016 with the workshops and seminars. And uh, in fact, since August of 2016, again in February 2019 and February 2020, uh, 2022 this year, he's, he's been with us instrumental. He's uh, been a guiding force for a lot of us here and truly believes in the potential of astrobiology research and the importance of institutions such as Amity and the work that we are establishing. He was appointed as a visiting faculty in uh, February 2020. Dr. Clark has taken part in six Mars analog expeditions to inland Australia, New Zealand, in India, and has conducted three rotations at the Mars Desert Research Station. His Martian interests include Martian geology, geomorphology, the terrestrial analogs, astrobiology, and exploration technologies, with an emphasis on habitats, vehicles, and suits. He's also contributed towards mission architectures and several landing site workshops. He currently serves as the president of Mars Society of Australia. He is on the Mars Society International Steering Committee and is a director of science at the Mars Desert Research Station. He had started out life as a paleontologist, doing honors in Silurian paleoecology at the University of Tasmania. He then on became an exploration geologist in South Australia, and he has immense experience working in all different sites and regions in Australia and also in different parts of the world. He has a PhD from Flinders University in Adelaide and brings to us an immense amount of experience from the geology side. And today's topic being, how did the world become habitable? The making of a habitable uh, planet. It gives me immense joy to have him kick off this session. Dr. Clark, you're with us. Over to you. OK. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Siddharth. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, be part of this amazing uh, program and to work closely with so many uh, fantastic people at Amity University in India more generally and uh, many friends and colleagues from all over the world. It's just uh, a pity because of the current circumstances that more of us can't be together at the same time at the same place, but uh, that will come. So without further ado, I will share my screen. Here we go. Um, can, uh, Siddharth, can you confirm with me you can see my screen? Yes, we can. We just uh, Fantastic. like it in slideshow mode, full screen. OK, making a habitable planet. If we're going to be talking about life uh, beyond Earth and looking for life beyond Earth, uh, we really have to start at home. Like charity, astrobiology starts at home. And when we start to, when we talk about looking for habitability elsewhere, uh, we know we have one example of a habitable planet that is ours. So how did our planet become rather just one planet in a solar system or a planetary system, but one that is actually inhabited by an extraordinary diversity of uh, life and has been has supported and sustained that life over many billions of years. And what lessons can we uh, draw from that uh, towards searching for life elsewhere in the solar system and indeed the universe? Uh, I'll be focusing in this talk on Earth, uh, but um, the application of these ideas uh, will be relevant to other talks, to other sessions uh, further down the line in other parts of this course. 
So Carl Sagan, the very famous American astronomer who uh, did a lot for astrobiology, once said, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you first have to make a universe. Um, I'm not going to go that far back, uh, but I will start with where planetary systems, including our own, are thought to begin from. And that's in these uh, dark bands that on a very clear night, uh, we can see uh, in the Milky Way, uh, if it's overhead, and these dark clouds are, if you like, star nurseries. There are where uh, stars and their associated planetary systems are thought to form. Uh, in many uh, mythologies about the sky, these dark, line, dark lanes uh, have uh, a significance. Uh, so, for example, in uh, many Australian Aboriginal uh, legends about the sky, uh, people can see um, things like an emu in the uh, shape of these dark patterns. And uh, you know, we now know that they are, in fact, as important as the, the bright stars and the bright nebula that we can also see uh, in the night sky, if the conditions are right. Now, the idea is that beginning with these dark clouds, uh, they gradually collapse to form uh, a dense cloud. And eventually, as that collapse continues, these clouds begin rotating and forming a disk. Uh, this can be modeled. And as I'll be showing, we can actually see this at various stages in the night sky through our telescopes. In the center part of the disk, uh, the temperatures and pressures become high enough to trigger thermonuclear uh, reactions and uh, the star is born. Uh, one of the uh, properties of this is we, we see a disk with a protostar in the beginning and uh, jets of material coming out from each pole of the star. And the dark disk that surrounds them is where planets begin to form. First, there's a disk of dust and fine, other fine grains, then protoplanets, and then eventually, as things stabilize, we end up with a, a star with different sized planets in various orbits around the, around the central sun. That's the theory. But as I said, we can actually see this. We can see this progression from the dust cloud and grains uh, uh, combining to form larger grains, planetesimals, protoplanets, and eventually planets. Here's a close up of one of these star nurseries, the Orion Nebula, which uh, is pretty much overhead uh, at certain times of the year for people who live in the tropics. And when we look at the nebula, we see these tiny little dark spots, if we've got a good enough image, like this Hubble image. And when we zoom in on them, we can see that we have this bright central star, a protostar, surrounded by the disk of dark gas. Uh, sometimes we see it more or less face on, sometimes we see it edge on, and in fact the bright star in the center is completely hidden by this rim. These are planetary systems that may be in the process of being formed, right out there in the sky over our heads. These are some other examples. Uh, this sort of um, hamburger, McDonald's, uh, uh, chicken burger structure is again a view of a dust disk and then the bright glow, the protostar coming out on either side. Um, here's another example of the protostellar disk and the jets that come out. And finally, another image um, face on a central star which has been blanked out so as to uh, not saturate the image, the disk and these dark lanes are thought to be where planets are sweeping up and um, clearing out uh, the fine particles from those lanes as they are in the, in the process of forming. So the theories that people came up with back in the 18th century 
are now being confirmed by direct observation. Uh, in our lifetime, I mean, these are these are images that were not possible to obtain, you know, more than a, perhaps uh, twenty years ago. So it's a tremendously exciting time that we live in to be able to see uh, planets and planetary systems uh, in the process of forming. So the starting points for the formation of planets are. The, is the, or rather is the interplanetary dust. As they form in, that ne in, in the nebula disk surrounding the stars, they form little droplets called chondrules. And here's a section through a meteorite. They're only a mil usually a millimeter or so across, like little, uh, little beads or little fish eggs. And they form in the hottest part of the solar nebula. They're silicates, they're rock. Uh, we also find other little grains, these strange white things, more irregularly shaped, which are what we call calcium rich inclusions. And they form actually before the solar system, actually in that dust cloud itself. And in the meteorites, we see within these grains, tiny grains, even smaller grains, which are actually older than the solar system themselves, itself, things we call pre-solar grains, over 5 billion years old. The rest of the meteorite is about um, you know, 4.6 billion years old, which we take as the age of the solar system. In between all these little grains, there is a mix of, oh, pardon me, organic uh, rich material, um, including amino acids and other uh, fine particles from the nebula, from the matrix. It's like a cake, if you like, with little, little bits of fruit and, and, and chocolate chips, all the rest, you know, in a matrix of fine flour. This is what we see in a carbonaceous chondrite, which is the, what we think is the most primitive meteorites. And we know that some asteroids are made up of this material and some comets are made up of this material as well. And uh, the majority, in fact, of meteorites that fall are of this kind. The majority of meteorites we find, though, are the metal meteorites, which are made of nickel and iron, simply because uh, these carbonaceous chondrites weather very quickly and become indistinguishable from ordinary rocks, whereas a big lump of, of, of iron is very visible and people do find them much more easily. So imagine these small objects, you know, made up of chondrites, which are formed by the melting of interstellar dust grains, uh, then would come together to form larger bodies that we call planetesimals. And we have an example here, um, a Kuiper belt object well beyond uh, the, the, um, the orbit of Pluto uh, illustrates how these planetesimals Form. So here it is, it looks like a, a dumbbell that you know, people will li lift to uh, exercise themselves. And you can see that within it, uh, it's got various domains. And in this geological sketch map next to it, you can see that they've all been mapped out. And these represent where different objects uh, have sort of come together uh, and they've retained their identity, but they have been uh, sort of fused together. And we can see another example, this is to the same scale, the comet 67P that a few years ago was visited by the European Rosetta mission. And again, it's got two lobes which are sort of stuck together, uh, but retained their, their separate physical and chemical identity. Yeah, because these are not energetic collisions. These are just two things sort of uh, gradually bumping together under very, very low velocities and staying separate, the planetesimals. But what happens is over time, these planetesimals get so large that when they join together, they start falling through their gravitational speed uh, fields and they pick up enough velocity. So when they collide, uh, if, if they don't fragment, uh, they are actually molten and they start forming an actual molten body. And we see an example of here with the asteroid uh, Vesta, which um, from memory is about 400 kilometers across. 
Um, you can see it start becoming more rounded. Uh, there are craters on it formed by smaller impacts. And this is actually the relic of a protoplanet. Uh, this is a miniature planet. It's, it's got a crust of basalt. And I'll talk about why that's important later. It's probably got a core, a metallic core. And again, that's something I'll talk about in a moment. But you see, it's still a funny shape. It was originally quite spherical, but various collisions have knocked big bits off it uh, at the top and especially down at its south pole. So it's no longer really a protoplanet, it's just a, a relic of one. But it gives us an idea, the sort of small bodies, bigger than planetesimals, smaller than large planets, that would have been common, probably hundreds if not thousands of these in the early solar system. And these protoplanets would collide to form true planets. Plan uh, planets such as the Earth, such as Mars, such as Jupiter. And there's a, an artist's impression here of a planet nice and round, largely molten, being impacted by these bodies. Now, when, you, when that happens, when you get a large uh, molten body of rock, it starts separating out. And a very famous uh, German scientist called Goldschmidt, or Swiss scientist called Goldschmidt, made incredible observations about this in the 19th century, studying how mineral ores, particularly copper ores, uh, behaved in a furnace. And he noted that the ores separated out into metals, like copper, like iron, which sink to the bottom, and the lighter elements, like uh, silicon and so on, rise to the top and form what in a furnace we'd call slag. And when you look at a planet, that's exactly what we see. We see in our Earth here, a core, which is of nickel iron, and a silicate uh, mantle and crust. And the same was going on in the Earth, throughout the solar system. Uh, in the formation of these protoplanets and the larger planets, some of them, like Vesta, as I showed earlier, have been partially or, or even in some cases completely disrupted by collision. And so a number of the meteorites that we see are actually from the interior of worlds that have been destroyed. So nickel iron meteorites, pure nickel iron, um, are from the cores of lost planets, small planets. The stony iron meteorites come from this transition zone between the mantle and the core. And the howardites, which are essentially basalt, like the rocks that uh, you find around uh, Mumbai, um, come from the, the mantle, or in fact, perhaps even in some cases, the crusts of uh, these former planets. So when we look at meteorites, we're not only seeing the interiors of what former planets, lost planets looked like, we're also getting a clue as to what the interior of our planet is like as well. Now, once that gross structure of the Earth had formed, you know, further processes become possible. Uh, one of them is that beneath the outer crust of the Earth, what we call, you know, the crust, or, or the, let me rephrase that, the outer crust on the Earth is actually rigid, no surprise, it's solid rock, it's about 100 kilometers thick, called the lithosphere, but underneath that, there is a zone, uh, about 100 kilometers down, which is partially molten, probably between 10 and 30 percent molten. And where that is able to escape to the surface, we start forming what are called mid-ocean ridges. And this seafloor spreading, you know, forms collisions where other parts of the crust get sucked down back into the mantle and then partially melten, molten again. And this is what we call plate tectonics. Now, as far as we know, Earth is the only planet in our solar system, which has that. And that's probably because the Earth is the largest of the rocky planets. 
Venus and Mars and some of the other rocky bodies in the solar system, like the moon, like Mercury, um, like Io, uh, some of other asteroids, were all molten at one stage in their uh, lives. And in larger cases like Mars and Venus and Mercury, they probably still have a molten core. But only the Earth was large enough to kick off uh, plate tectonics. And that has an enormous impact on the history of our Earth. Here's another, another diagram of uh, the plate tectonic process. Um, you can see this at the mid-ocean ridges here. Uh, there's a mid-ocean ridge in the Indian Ocean, uh, uh, and uh, uh, that is you know, pushing north. Um, and India is attached to that plate, as is Australia. And that is called, as India is pushed up against the rest of Asia, you know, it forms the Himalayas. Um, there used to be, a, a, you know, India used to be here. Um, and there used to be a deep trench where the Indian and Australian plate was diving down under the Asian plate. Now that, that ocean has closed up and India and Asia have formed this um, a single landmass. But India is still being pushed north against Asia and uh, trying to burrow underneath. And this is what's pushing up the Himalaya ranges. Um, the sort of rocks we get along these mid-ocean ridges are what we call basalt. We also get island volcanoes that form island chains in the ocean, like the Hawaiian chain. And as this plate gets pulled back down or sinks back down into the earth, it starts melting as, as well. And in fact, the volatile elements, the uh, water, the carbon dioxide that gets given off from this ocean crust, this being subducted, being pulled down into the earth, acts as a flux. Anyone who's done soldering uh, is familiar with the idea of a flux, something that you add to another substance that reduces its melting point. People who make glazes and so on do that as well. So water and carbon dioxide coming off this um, plate go down here act as a flux and cause melting uh, in this upper plate. And that of course results in volcanoes. Now, the chemistry of those volcanoes is quite different to the basalts here. These volcanoes here are much richer in silicon and uh, aluminium and calcium, potassium, sodium and so on. And they form through volcanism and intrusion uh, and erosion and formation of sediments on that eroded material, what we call the continental crust. Without that process, the Earth would be an ocean planet, maybe a few volcanic islands. But because we have subduction, because we have these uh, formation of uh, secondary volcanoes along the collision zones, we have continental crust <clears throat> and life as we know it becomes possible. Now, the end result <clears throat> of all this seafloor splitting and subduction is that the continents, which are really like the scum on the surface of a, of a boiling pot of soup or curry, are moved around. This causes continental drift. And here we have a series of paleogeographic maps uh, through time of how continents have wandered around, you know, starting back 650 million years ago, uh, moving forward through time, um, and uh, forming supercontinents, joining together. Those then break up and start moving. We start hints of the familiar continents here. There's Africa, South America. There's India forming an island, right? This is at the time when the dinosaurs became extinct. And then they all gradually acquire their present position in this map here. But continental drift and plate tectonics is still going on. So in 50 million years time, the Atlantic will be much wider. India and Europe and, and Asia may well have joined up with uh, North America to form a supercontinent. Um, Australia is still an island. And then looking 250 billion years in the future, we may well have another supercontinent. So the continents we see today that are seem so fixed are moving around like scum on a soup pot or ice flows in the Arctic. Um, when you take the long 
geological time perspective. And you'll hear more about plate tectonics in other talks um, in this series. But how do we know all this? How do we look back into time and work out how and when and why all of these things happen? This is the Grand Canyon, a very famous part of the world where we can see uh, part of the Earth's history laid down in layers of rocks. Oldest ones at the bottom, youngest ones at the top. And we can use those principles that, you know, you can't lay down an old rock on top of a young rock. We can use these principles of succession, of cross-cutting relationships to work out the sequence of events that form uh, the rocks of the Earth's crust. Um, so, you know, here, the oldest rocks are marked in A. Uh, they have been cut by a fault here, which has offset them. Um, the rocks have then been intruded by this mass, probably granite, offset by um, another fault, but that's actually much later, so we'll come back to that. And then the whole thing has been eroded down to bedrock and flat sediments have been laid down on top. And then D has come in, and then there's been more, uh, there has been the fault here. You can see it's formed a cliff in the landscape. And then lastly, we have this other sediment layer at the very top. It looks complicated, but when you actually just go through it step by step, you know, in any part of the world, you can work out the sequence of events that have made the geology, the rocks of that area. That's what we call lithostratigraphy, relative time. We don't know how many years, you know, whether, whether it's 10 years or a million years or a billion years that separates the events, but we can simply say that A is followed by B and is followed by C. Using radiometric dating, and uh, which involves uh, radioactive isotopes found in rocks and in different minerals, we can work out the actual ages when these rocks were formed. Um, I don't want to get too much into the detail here, but basically radioactive decay works on the hourglass principle. You know, the top of your hourglass or your egg timer um, is the parent, the sand in there trickles through to the bottom, and we're looking at the ratio between what's in the bottom and what's in the top, you know how long um, it's been since the process started. Same with radioactive decay. The, the paired elements decay to the daughter elements at a fixed rate. And by looking at the ratios of these elements in crystals, uh, we can work out uh, how much time has elapsed since those minerals, those crystals were formed. It's a very simple description of what is actually a very complex process and a very sophisticated analytical technique. So if there are any radiometric dating experts in the audience, please forgive my simplification. And the important thing about both these principles is that they will work anywhere in the universe. So when we go to Mars, we see that rocks are laid down in layers. Right. This is Mount Sharp in Gale Crater, a view taken by the Curiosity rover. And uh, Dr. Jennifer Blank is a part of the team working on that, uh, on that mission. And we know that these rocks down the bottom were laid down before these rocks up the top. And you can see that there are actually a range of different compositions. These are more brownish, these are more bluish. This is a very light color, back to sort of more brownish gray up there. And by driving a rover, or perhaps one day an astronaut walking up this, uh, these hills, we can work out the history of a sizable chunk of Mars. And these principles not only work on Mars, but anywhere in the solar system and indeed anywhere in the universe where there are rocks. So let's look at the history of the planet in more detail, that, particularly what happens on the crust. As I mentioned, the solar system started forming about 
billion years, years ago, about 4.5 billion years ago, our planet existed. And by a bit over 4 billion years ago, yeah, we know from minerals uh, found in very old rocks uh, in Canada and Australia that the Earth had a crust. The earliest continents indeed were forming. Uh, there was an atmosphere and there was a hydrosphere. There, was, there were lakes and seas on the surface. Uh, the atmosphere would have been quite different to what it is now. And these sort of reddish clouds, I think, in this artist's impression are designed to sort of illustrate that. And all sorts of things are going on in that early Earth that we don't see happening now, like these weird lavas that we get in Canada and uh, South Africa and in Australia. They're called komatiites, which are very rich in magnesium oxide, yeah, more than 18%. And to get those lavas, you have to have really, really hot magmas erupting out on the, on the surface between 1300 and 1600 degrees. Whereas your average volcano, like in Hawaii, are erupting out at about 1100 degrees. And these rocks really only occur on Earth before about 2.5 billion years. After that, I think there's only one or maybe two examples known. But before that, they're very common because the early Earth had a much higher gradient of temperatures from inside to outside. Our Earth is getting old and a bit more sedate, and we no longer have these very, very violent lava eruptions. But in this world of, of very hot lavas, different atmospheres, different water chemistries, we start to find life appearing. The earliest signs of life are things that we call Stromatolites. And in fact, if we go back to that artist's impression, actually shows stromatolites uh, growing in the edge of this, this sea or this lake. Um, here are modern stromatolites in Shark Bay. And some of us have been there. Uh, the Shark Bay is on the west coast of, of Australia. And here are ancient stromatolites three and a half billion years ago, again in Western Australia. Uh, they look a bit like Mickey Mouse ears, I think. Um, but these, when we find them in the geological record, show us that there was life around because these structures are formed by the growth of, of microbes, usually photosynthetic microbes, cyanobacteria, uh, and some other kinds of microbes as well. We also find them in hot springs. So here's a hot spring up in um, at Puga in Ladakh. Here's another hot spring in New Zealand. Uh, there's a champagne pool, it's called champagne. You see little bubbles of carbon dioxide coming up. It's about 98 degrees, not quite boiling. And we've got these strange little bushes here, which are actually mini stromatolites forming um, around the edges of the pool by microbial growths. We also have all of these sort of reddish brown deposits there, which are arsenic deposits, which um, uh, wouldn't be very healthy for our sort of life, but the bacteria love it. Um, this material is also running about uh, uh, two to three grams per ton gold. So it's actually a gold deposit in the process of forming. The microbes uh, were responsible, uh, many of these microbes and stromatolites um, are, as I said, photosynthetic. And as they released oxygen in the very early Earth, you know, this oxygen would have started building up in the oceans. It would start reacting with, a, uh, with various minerals, which would otherwise, um, and when those minerals were fully oxidized, that, um, that oxygen could start escaping through the water, like the bubbles here off the algae, this algal slime, uh, and building up in the atmosphere. If you look at um, the oxygen content in uh, the atmosphere over time, we can see that, oops, this goes the other way. Um, you can see that moving from left to right, uh, the oxygen level uh, was fairly low, you know, less than um, a tenth of, a, perhaps about a twentieth of an atmosphere. You certainly could breathe that and then builds up quite rapidly through time with the appearance of more and more life, particularly land life and trees and other vegetation um, up to levels that we could breathe. I mean, currently our atmosphere is about 20% uh, 
um, oxygen. There have been times when it's been over 30% oxygen um, back in the, what we call the Carboniferous, when a lot of the world's coal deposits were laid down, not all of them, uh, but particularly in North America and Europe, uh, it was over 30%. And that is actually about as high as it can go. Because when the oxygen goes over 30%, what happens? You get catastrophic fires. You know, we think the fires that are in California now are catastrophic or in Australia earlier this year, catastrophic. Well, imagine what it's like when there's 35% oxygen in the atmosphere. And when you look at these ancient coal deposits, we can see layers of ash from ancient wildfires. And of course, we have wildfires that removes the, the oxygen from the atmosphere and brings it back down. So after this period of great <clears throat> activity, oxygen fell down to what we would call more reasonable levels uh, through the time of the dinosaurs uh, to the present. So I talked about the impact of this in the minerals. Ancient rocks are mostly what we call uh, gray stones or gray beds. They're dark gray rocks. They have sulfide minerals called pyrite in them. But when you add oxygen to that environment, we get what we call red beds because we get oxidized iron. And in fact, many of the world's large iron ore deposits come from the great oxida oxygenation of the Earth's oceans about two and a half billion years ago. Uh, gray, from gray, gray beds and black shales to banded iron stones and uh, right up to um, more common uh, red rocks that we find on land today. So in India, for example, in many areas we have what people call uh, laterite, which is just essentially an ironstone that's formed through weathering. Uh, many river sands are yellowish or orange because they have oxidized iron in them because we have oxygen in the atmosphere, which is from life. So life, the presence of life on earth has resulted in a complete transformation of the earth's crust. And so you have this wonderful inter interplay in a habitable planet. We need certain conditions for a habitable planet. We need plate tectonics to generate land. We, um, and once life gets started and it starts producing things like oxygen, that in turn changes the chemistry of the ocean, of the atmosphere, of the land itself, and ultimately the whole crust, uh, because we've had billions of years for this chemically um, mediated uh, ge geological processes to be happening. So when we look out in the solar system and further on in the universe, if you want to look for inhabited planets, inhabited at least by microbes, we start looking for signs of these sort of changes, for oxygen in the atmosphere, for um, um, organic matter in the rocks, you know, things like coal, you know, coal and black shales and things like that. We look for signs of hematite, where oxygen has reacted with um, uh, reduced iron uh, in the sediments in the crust to form oxidized uh, minerals. And what is the history of life? Well, the earliest lives we have uh, are cyanobacteria. Yeah, bacteria, they, they don't really have a nucleus, they're just little cells. Uh, they can do lots of things. They can deal with very hostile environments. They also have things like uh, they can photosynthesize. But by about 1.5 billion years ago, Right, we start feeding what we call what we call eukaryotes. The earliest ones are prokaryotes. The eukaryotes are much more complex cells. Uh, they have a nucleus. They're various little organelles, little structures in them that do specialized tasks. They have much more complex structures, as we can see here. And in fact, we are eukaryotes. Every one of our cells has a nucleus. It has complex organelles in it. So we, <coughs> pardon me, we have a lot in common, even with uh, amoeba, and other single cell animals and plants. <coughs> Moving forward in time from 1.2 billion years ago, by the time we get to 560 million years ago, we start seeing um, much larger and more complex multicellular animals where these eukaryotic cells, <coughs> pardon me, have come together by process we don't fully understand to form large complex animals like these Ediacara fauna, which are found in some, which some of the first of these large complex animals to be found. 
they occur in every continent. They are found in India. They're first recognized in the UK. They're named after a location in Australia, Ediacara Hills. And there are these weird looking animals which often don't have much in the way of modern counterparts. And after that, of course, we started getting uh, more familiar creatures, you know, the trilobites, uh, the early fish, some of them quite bizarre, <coughs> with the invention of skeletons about 540 million years ago, the Cambrian explosion. And that's something else for another talk. Really, from the point of view, the evolution of life and the diversity of life, uh, we can say the last 540 million years has been, or 560 million years has been the most exciting because we have all sorts of things. We've got you know, fossil vertebrates, we've got giant insects, we've got land plants and weird leaves and uh, all sorts of corals and sponges, all sorts of things developing and appearing and changing the crust. But that but the billions of, you know, the two billion years of life history before that are in fact probably more important because all of the biochemistry, the, the cell structure, the, the, um, uh, the microbial pathways, the metabolic pathways, pardon me, uh, that allow this diversity to um, occur all happened in that earlier history of the earth. So, when we talk about diversity of life today, remember that that is built on an almost invisible foundation of microscopic, biochemical, and genetic evolution in things that we call rather boring bacteria and, and uh, algae and so on. And this sort of life, this advanced life too, has had a huge impact on the surface of the planet. So for example, these are glossopterous leaves first recognized in India. Uh, these leaves define Gondwana land. We find them in South America and Africa, Antarctica, Australia, uh, as well as India. And they show that all these southern continents were once uh, linked together. And leaves like this allow the buildup in the right environment of coal deposits of various types, which were not possible before there were these large complex land plants. I mentioned the huge oxygen buildup uh, during the Carboniferous. Well, one of the things that allowed, if you've got 35% oxygen, you can, in the atmosphere, you can start getting giant insects. This is a dragonfly, the wingspan of about a meter. Yeah, for people who don't like insects, it's probably, perhaps just as well, we don't have those around. But I think it would have been rather cool to see bugs of that size. But as much as the increase in diversity of life is important, so is the fact that there are what we call mass extinctions. So through history, there's been uh, the last 560 million years or so, there's been one, two, three, four, five major mass extinction events. And these, um, these peaks, there's two here which aren't labeled, but uh, they're perhaps earlier ones. Um, but these peaks represent extremely high rates of extinction. So 40%, 50% of extinctions happen uh, during these times and these periods in between are what we would call normal, normal events. And there are many causes. Some of them we understand. The end Cretaceous was when a large uh, asteroid struck the earth in what is now Mexico and wiped out much of life on earth. Um, some of the others um, uh, may be related to other astronomical events. Uh, people suggested that these may be related to uh, supernova, which produced gamma ray bursts, which irradiated the Earth and killed off a lot of life. Others, like this big one at the end of the Permian and also at the end of the Triassic, we don't know what caused them. And of course, um, we are currently now living in what for many organisms also a mass extinction event due to human modification of the environment over the last 20,000 to 40,000 years through hunting, through land clearance, uh, through um, uh, other ways of, of changing the environment. So some species of animals are no longer and plants are no longer able to live. But these mass extinctions are really important because after each mass extinction, life 
restarts. Yeah, it's a bit like a forest fire. A forest fire obliterates an ecosystem, but it begins again coming back after that fire, in some cases bigger and better than before. And so the dinosaurs uh, only flourished because of the Permian mass extinction made it possible for them to develop. And the mammals were able to, develop, to diversify. You know, mammals were little scurry, furry creatures down here throughout uh, the uh, Triassic and Jurassic Cretaceous. But when the dinosaurs went, they were able to uh, diversify into everything from you know, rabbits to uh, whales to, um, to bats and even human beings. So when we come back to the most recent past, we start coming into the deep history of humanity. 80 million years ago, we have the first hominids, the first uh, primates that have some aff affinity with our line. Um, six million years ago, the first hominins. Two and a half million years ago, the first members of our genus, genus Homo. 600,000 years ago, archaic humans, um, Neanderthals, uh, Denisovians, uh, perhaps some other groups as well. And 300,000 years ago, we have anatomically modern humans. You put them in modern clothes, <clears throat> put them in a sari, put them in a suit, and they walk down the road and you wouldn't be able to tell them apart from everybody else. But 80,000 years ago, and these numbers are all subject to change from research, something very interesting happened that we don't understand. People started behaving in modern ways. I don't mean modern as in the last couple of hundred years. They start not only looking like modern humans, but start behaving in ways that we can see as uh, we can see ourselves in. They start burying their dead. They start caring for their, um, their injured. I mean, the creatures before here, they may look quite human, but if they broke their leg, they would die, just like a wild animal. If you're a, an antelope or a lion and you break your leg, you either become food or you starve. But well, if when a human breaks our leg, yeah, people care for us. Our legs heal and we're able to resume our place. And when we look at ancient humans from about 80,000 years on, we find the humans are able to, are starting to look after uh, look after each other. We find skeletons of people who lost their arms when they were young adults, but they've lived to their 60s or 70s. We find skeletons of dwarves, people who are congenitally deformed uh, and yet have clearly led long lives. Uh, we see the first art, uh, and of course an example there, um, uh, be it um, sculpture or painting, um, or intricate uh, beadwork. Um, these, are, these are done by people that behave in ways like us. And of course, coming forward in time, you know, the first agriculture, um, perhaps 12,000 years ago, six and a half thousand years ago, the first, seal, uh, first um, cities, uh, metallurgy, uh, the agricultural revolution really kicks off about, uh, uh, about uh, nine, 10,000 BC industrial revolution a few hundred years ago, and of course, 1957, the space age. So that history of humanity, I think, can be summed up by this, these two footprints. Over 3.6 million years ago in Africa, a naked human footprint by one of our ancestors, and of course, in 1969, people on the moon. And this also leads to um, an understanding of habitability that's going on into the future, that through the technology, through understanding, what defines a habitable planet is not simply one like the Earth, but it may also include places like the Moon, like Mars, where we could perhaps eventually one day travel to and start building thriving communities uh, on there, new places for humans and animals and plants uh, from Earth to flourish assuming, of course, they don't have their own life forms there um, that we need to protect. So that's how we have built our habitable planet. And as we go through this course, I think it's important for us all to start thinking about how we would recognize these various features in the planets out there in the solar system elsewhere 
in the universe. Okay, that's the end of that. Back to you, Siddharth. Thank you very much. Please receive our applause from all around the world. Dr. John, you've done an amazing job introducing the class to such a complicated, wide topic, but in a, in a such a succinct manner, in a simple manner. And I'm sure that students are taking notes. I'm also delighted to see uh, Dr. Asim Chohanji and uh, Dr. General Sharma sir and the others who have stayed with us throughout this lecture. So that's a testament to the amount of curiosity and uh, excitement that we have for this, for this particular field. So thank you very much, uh, John, for that. Any, any, uh, any initial comments uh, from our senior dignitaries? Uh, we'd be happy to take questions from the students. Yes, sir. Uh, Siddharth, just uh, I want to interject for a moment. Uh, uh, Dr. Clark, your presentation was excellent, uh, very informative. And Siddharth, I want to inform you that uh, we also have online listening, and he has been listening throughout the session. Our founder president, Dr. Shok Johan himself, you know how busy he is uh, yes, with sir. his uh, you know, work all over the world, but uh, he has been in this session the whole time, uh, despite other meetings also happening. Uh, but uh, maybe you can begin the question and answer. And after a little while, we will ask him to also say a few words and share his thoughts. Uh, yes, but sir. first, immediately now you can begin. But I wanted to inform you that we have our founder also online, which is, which is so wonderful for all of us. Thank you very much for letting me know, sir. I hadn't noticed that, and I'm really, really honored to have his, uh, his audience with us. OK, so we'll take a few questions. For those of you whose questions are not being uh, tackled, please do not fear. Uh, the teaching assistants will make sure that we have all the questions written down, and we'll make sure that all the questions are answered for this session, because it's important for us that all of your voices are heard. Uh, the first question is from Neha Potnis. She asks, how does the position of the moon affect the plate tectonics? Sorry, could you say that again, please, Siddha? How does the position of the moon affect the plate tectonics? Mm. That's an interesting question. Um, as, it, as the moon orbits the Earth because of what we call the, the uh, it causes tides, of course we know, and um, that those tides cause the, the moon to progressively move into our, some, a higher orbit. So, Early in Earth history, um, the moon was probably a lot closer to Earth than it is now. And uh, people have actually looked at uh, uh, tides cause particular sedimentary patterns in the geological record. And in some places you can actually, uh, you can look at uh, uh, th these tidal patterns and you can look at their frequency and you can actually work out how many how many times those tides occurred in the month, and then you can work out yeah, how many times uh, the moon was orbiting the Earth in that period, and the moon was actually somewhat closer. So early in Earth history, there was a lot, certainly a lot more heating going on um, inside the Earth from lunar tides. And we see this in extreme example elsewhere in the solar system. There is a moon orbiting Jupiter that's called Io, and um, that's relatively close to Jupiter. The tides are very, very strong. And the flexing of the structure of that moon is so intense that it is largely molten inside. I mean, you, you get, anyone gets got a paper clip, you pick up a paper, paper clip and you bend it like this really quickly for a 30 seconds and it'll break. And you touch the broken end and it's hot. That's exactly the same thing. So tides by the moon certainly do cause heating um, and may have been particularly significant in the early earth in generating that sort of heat uh, that causes, leads to plate tectonics, but there are other sources of heat as well. You think of all those uh, bodies colliding together to make the earth, they release a lot of heat as well. And that was probably very important early on in the history of the earth. But there's also radioactive elements inside the Earth itself, um, potassium, uranium, and thorium. And these decay, releasing heat. And probably most of the heat we get now in the Earth uh, is made up of uh, this radioactive heat uh, that is being generated. But in other solar systems, in other planets, it could be quite different. Io, it's entirely tidal. Uh, Mars, 
doesn't have a significant moons, doesn't have significant tides. So it's relying on the primordial heat um, and also the heat from radioactive decay. Now, Mars used to have plate tectonics, we think, but it's shut down because it is cooled to the point that plate tectonics is no longer possible because it's such a small body, it's cooled faster. You know, you get two lumps of metal, put the, you know, one this big, one this big, and put it in the fire till they're both red hot, and you pull them out uh, on your shovel, and the small one will cool down a lot faster than the big one. It's the same with planets. Mars is still probably liquid inside, uh, but nowhere near hot enough to sustain things like plate tectonics. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, here's another question from Navang Sherpa, who I believe, because I've been uh, communicating with some students joining us from Nepal. He asks, you have spoken to us about the change in the oxygen concentration levels in our atmosphere as the Earth was going through its you know, ages. And you spoke about the importance of you know, measuring that and the role oxygen concentration has played and how evolution of life has taken place. So he asks, how do we know about the change in oxygen concentration in the atmosphere over all these years? That's, that's a very good question. It's, the effect is quite subtle. Um, the big change is the one I mentioned. So for example, if there was no oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere, we, we would expect to find um, compounds that are what we call reduced. So we'd, effect, uh, we'd expect to find iron sulfides, iron two plus, minerals um, and we see that we see pyrite uh, we see um, uh, most volcanic rocks of iron two plus in them so we know the interior of the earth is reduced we start adding oxygen elements like iron become oxidized they become iron three plus and so we see things like hematite which is a iron three plus mineral um, and we see all of this uh, uh, and we see these trends increasing over time. So that's how we know that you know, the early Earth had very little or no oxygen, but by the time of 2.5 billion years ago, there was enough oxygen in the oceans to form hematite deposits. And by the time we come to 500 million years ago, uh, there's enough for terrestrial sediments, river sediments, and lake sediments, and shallow water sediments to be predominantly um, supporting um, hematite and other oxidized minerals. And you can do calculations to work out what's the maximum and minimum amount of oxygen you need to create that. Um, there, are, there are other of things like manganese, like arsenic that you can also look at to try and constrain that. The higher oxygen contents, uh, like during the Carboniferous and more recently uh, when the big coal deposits of Europe and America were formed, uh, and to a lesser degree in the Miocene, when again, big coal deposits in Australia and, uh, and Europe uh, and some parts of Asia occurred. Um, it's a little bit harder to measure, but, but people can calculate the amount of plant material that had to exist to form those coal deposits. And then you can calculate the amount of oxygen they release to the atmosphere. And you, you have to end up with very, very high um, amounts of oxygen, you know, 30% or so uh, uh, as a result of that. Of course, the upper level of that is determined by the fact if you have too much oxygen, then everything burns. And so that sort of controls the maximum, which is about 35%. Um, and of course, we, we know that from, from chemistry, we know that from practical experience, if you're doing oxygen therapy in a hospital to people, um, if you're giving high levels of oxygen, you need special uh, greases, you need special materials in the oxygen supply equipment so they don't spontaneously combust. And so uh, we, can, we can calculate the upper liver there. But look, it, it's a little bit of, you know, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, a bit of a piece here, a bit of a piece here, and, um, and you join it all together and you hope you end up with a picture of the elephant and not of a giraffe. Thank you, John, that was great. Another, another point that I think I should really highlight here, you know, when we go through all of these topics, is that astrobiology is not just understanding the biology. It has so much to do with the atmosphere, how the geology was evolving, how the planets and the moons were uh, evolving. So ast uh, astrophysics has an important role to play. So it just brings out the complex interdisciplinary nature of the field. You know, just the fact that the variation of oxygen 
over these billions of years, how that atmospheric change, in fact, led to the different ways in which uh, life was evolving. And then you had these extinction events. So I'm going to club a couple of questions and pose it to you. How did we know and how did we measure the percentage or the rate of these mass extinctions? You know, how were they recorded that there was actually a complete annihilation of a particular species, for example, taking place? What were these records like? And another added question to that is, are we in the beginning of another such mass extinction event? And we're already seeing reports of a lot of, uh, you know, different forms of life that are now going extinct. So your comments on that. Mm. Well, some of these extinction events, we've got a pretty good idea of why they happen. I mean, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, you know, we've got the smoking gun, you know, or the, the smoking crater in, uh, in Mexico. Um, but things are really completely certain in geology and there, were, there may well have been other things going on. So for example, in the very late Cretaceous, we had these huge volcanic eruptions in, in India forming the Deccan Traps. And they were large enough to have a significant impact on things like uh, sulfur compounds in the atmosphere. There'll be a lot of dust, volcanic ash in the atmosphere. And some people think that actually life, the extinction is already starting as a result of these big volcanic eruptions uh, and that the asteroid was just the final thing to, uh, the final straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, with the Permian um, mass extinction, we, which is still very mysterious. There were certainly very, very large volcanic eruptions, far bigger than the Deccan Traps, uh, eruptions occurring in Siberia at that time. And perhaps they had an influence. Uh, also, uh, there was a um, uh, you know, big volcanic eruptions associated with large inputs of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which of course could cause global warming. Um, there were big sea level changes at the end of the Permian as well. So. That one may have been multifactorial. Um, also, some animals and plants end up having very, very bad, end up in very, very bad positions from an evolutionary point of view. They live in a very small, a very unique environment or live on one particular uh, type of diet. Uh, and uh, because of those evolutionary choices, if you like, even though they don't consciously make them, uh, they become very vulnerable to often very small environmental changes. I mean, the classic example you have in the world today is the panda. I mean, the panda, uh, giant panda living on only basically one or two types of bamboo in a small part of the world is really painted itself into a corner. And even without humans, um, uh, it would be very vulnerable to extinction. And it's taken a lot of effort by governments to to actually preserve pandas. And there are now more pandas in the world than there have been for many, many decades, which is a good thing. Uh, but uh, if you like pandas, but um, you know, there are lots of animals like that. Other animals can survive almost anywhere, like rats. You know, <laughs> rats, are, rats and cockroaches are tremendously successful because they're so adaptable. Um, and they'll be around probably a long time after many other creatures have disappeared. I mean, cockroaches go back to before the Permian mass extinction. Uh, they can survive almost anything. Um, so it's it's very it's very very variable. What one rough thing is, very large animals find it more difficult to survive a mass extinction event, which involves an, a change in climate or environment. So you can imagine you take an elephant. Your know, elephants need a huge amount of area to feed, right? If a, if a large fraction of if the amount of land available for each elephant decreases, it's harder for the elephants to survive. And this is why they're under pressure in many parts of the world. Um, something like a rat, you know, it doesn't need a lot of food. It doesn't need a lot of area uh, and uh, it can survive on almost anything. It doesn't need one type of food. It can live on almost, you know, it can live on scavenging. It can, it can find seeds, it can find insects um, and they survive. So very, very, it's a very complex, uh, process. And, and the second part of the question was, are we, are we in the middle of an extinction event? Yes, in, in some ways we are. Um, and it's an extinction event that has come in several ways. So 
around about 40,000 years ago, uh, our ancestors uh, developed new, two things, it appears, new hunting technologies using new and more e efficient tools. And they also seem to develop the use, large scale use of fire. People were using fire well before that, but large scale use of fire to change vegetation, to hunt game. Um, some of this was done deliberately, some of it was probably accidental, but because of these two things, more efficient hunting and landscape change, um, we get mass extinctions in most continents. So in North America, when these, this technology arrives, in Australia, in South America, on Madagascar, you know, 40,000 years ago for Australia, 50,000 years ago, um, 20 odd thousand years ago in North and South America, um, a few hundred years ago in Madagascar, when people arrive with these technologies, within a few thousand years or even a few decades, all the big animals become extinct. Yeah. Either because they tasted nice or because the environment has changed so much they can no longer survive. The exceptions were the same in Europe as well, about 40, 50,000 years ago. So the other mastodons go, the giant wombats in Australia disappear, the giant birds in Madagascar have gone. Um, and not just the animals that people would have hunted, but also the things that depended on them, like saber-toothed tigers and so on. Um, two exceptions were Africa and Southern Asia, where we still get the, uh, these giant animals. We still get rhinoceroses and um, elephants and giraffes and uh, you know, giant cattle, moor and so on. And, and that may be because these are the areas where people have lived the longest and these animals are able to co-evolve with this technology and survive, you know, living with smarter, more deadly humans. Now, coming into, coming into the period of agriculture, you know, 10,000 years ago, a bit less, of course, a massive land clearance. And, you know, we, we look at ourselves, our own culture, we see, you know, it's terrible what we're doing to the environment, but the most destructive, environmentally destructive humans are people with a fire stick in one hand and a spear in the other. And huge extinctions, particularly of plants, but also other animals happen because of land clearance for agriculture, and that's still happening. And of course, in more recent you know, decades of the population explosion, you know, that has intensified. But it's not all bad. I mean, we have also done tremendous, we, we recognize this is happening, um, and we are doing a lot to try and reverse this. And so many vulnerable animals, you know, like the panda, like the African rhino, there are now more pandas in the world, there are more tigers in the world, there are more uh, black rhinos in the world than there were 20 years ago. Um, it's a choice that we have. You know, our ancestors didn't know better. You know, we have this choice. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. John. At this point of time, I am delighted to announce that we are joined with us by our honorable founder president, sir, Dr. Ashok uh, K. Chauhan, sir. Uh, for those of you, I would like to give a short introduction for him. Dr. Ashok K. Chauhan, sir, is India's leading uh, visionary, industrialist, educationist. He has been, he has started the Amity Universe and he leads us and guides us through all of his different emails and messages that we receive every day from him. And I am aware of the short and valuable time he has. So over to you, Dr. Ashok K. Sohan, sir. We are delighted and honored to have you with us, sir. I am very pleased, greatly honored, highly satisfied, and have amazing experience today to be with you all. Many instances are remembered for decades, but many are remembered for centuries. Or today, we all are experiencing an event, MIT Center of Excellence for Astrobiology, which will be remembered for millenniums. I compliment Dr. Seem Chohanji, who together with the active initiation of Dr. Siddharth Pandey, in June this year, submitted a concept note to ISRO and DRDO, and they very soon 
found that this is an area where a lot of research, innovation, and findings need to be done. This is the area which is still not properly and rightly explored. I know about it because few years back, the students of our MIT International School won a competition of NASA. And after clearing all national levels, they were invited by NASA. And there and then itself, they were told to make a concept note for a habitat at Mars. Seven days they were given. And they were to prepare everything which material, all essentials needed for a habitat at Mars. And the institutions and organizations were called from all over the world. And in the last day, the two teams were declared as which will be going to the final, China and India. And we all will feel proud that the eight member student team of our MIT International School NOIDA stood globally first. So that way, the today's event is of extreme importance for me because our chairperson, Dr. Mita Chuanji, is far so pleased. These students must have passed out, but I will locate them and we will tell them and we'll show them the today's event. I think this is the area following the practice of MIT, we always walk through in the new areas where others have not even thought or considered. I am very glad for the deliberation of Dr. W. Silmamurthy, our very worthy, my brotherly, Dr. Lefty V.K. Sharma, and special compliment to Dr. Siddharth Pandey. I heard from the very beginning, from 9.30 a.m., and the opening remark from Siddharth Pandey. Then I heard the lecture of our ISRO giant, Dr. P. Sri Kumar. And also now I'm facing and listening to Dr. Johatan Clarke, Clark, Dr. Alisa Hadaji, Dr. Misail Mercy, Dr. Afisa Khan, and Dr. Ansela Biatan. These people will be remembered for millenniums. I'm not having any doubt in it because we are entering in an area where the innovative, brilliant minds are always looking to do something different, something new, something important. The life at universe is such a topic which encompasses many, many areas, physics, chemistry, biology, I would also say anthropology, and all such areas in the morning while I was looking at it from 9.30, seeing the importance, I immediately sent to 15 of my people from space science, from astro astronomy and astrophysics, Dr. Suresh Chandra and Dr. Sumita Ratan and Dr. M.S. Prasad. I told them you should see it and we will make a chapter. Siddharth Pandey will make a chapter of this grand and unique excellence center at our all university campuses in India, and most specifically at the global research hub of New York, uh, New York uh, established by Asim Chohanji to make a big research center at the research hub in 170 acres. I want to show to the whole world that we are going on a path which has never been as yet given the importance which it should be given. Also, I'm very proud to my volunteer teaching assistants. I must name them. Nidhi, Tanvi, Shireen, Anurup, Catherine, and Joval Varghese. I think you people are very wise, very foresighted that you are so with dedication, engaging yourself this. I feel proud that our 
Dr. Seem Johan ji has fully supported it. And I all thank to all those who have spoken. I heard all lectures. And one very worthy professor was telling, there was an opinion that there can't be any life at sun because of such high temperatures. And this was a learning for me to listen. We thought the idea that why not? If the people are living on planet Earth, they are used to such temperatures, their weather, their circumstances, the attacks of global warming, climate change. Why he told that saint or monk, which was liked by professor, why should not we believe that at sun, such situations, such temperatures exist where people are used to, their bodies are used to. So I think this gives us a learning in our general life also, that one can not leave anything aside and say, it's not possible to have a habitat at sun or people live there. So I think this is for my all students, a great motivation and inspiration and learning to always think, why not? So I appreciate the worthy professor giving this example and I bless Dr. Sim Chohan. And now we should plan it let us register some worthy PhD students. We'll support them. Let's make a center in Dubai, in our all campuses, because this is an area we cannot lose a single day, a single hour. Siddharth, we should move very fast. And also my vice chancellors, they are listening. A large number of faculty members are listening. They will all be the member of the team to make this crusade. My compliment, my congratulations to Dr. Atul Chohanji, the brother of Dr. Seem Chohan, who is chancellor and also president of RBF. I would say that Dr. Seem Chohan, Dr. Atul Chohan, and also our chairperson, having a large number of students, brilliant students, I think we are entering a crusade which will be remembered, which will be, example will be given. So my compliment, my blessings, and my appreciation and this thing, I'm so glad we are having more than 3,500 webinars during this lockdown period. But I think this was one of the most important because research is my hobby. I eat research, I dream research, I sleep research, I get up research. So when I see this excellent area, you can see that I can work still harder. I'm working 15 hours a day I can work still harder to see that your this center makes an example for all students, research scholar, PhD scholar, postdoc, and people will follow us, learn us. My again, compliment to each one of you. Thanks. Wonderful. Dr. Chauhan, we are so grateful to you. We cannot thank you enough uh, to all the students and other audience members who may be meeting uh, founder President Dr. Ashok Chauhan for the first time. People wait for weeks and months to get an appointment and to take even five minutes of his time. But the fact that he has come on to today's session on his own, uh, seeing the program and has sat through all of it, Siddharth, I think it's a big compliment to you and to all the experts online that this area is one which has great potential. Uh, people say that Founder President uh, Dr. Chauhan can see decades into the future. And I think his words are greatly motivating to us. It will inspire us to do much more work. I think it will galvanize the efforts, not only of Amity, but our partners at ISRO and DRDO and many global uh, partners that we have online right now. And we'll put even more emphasis on this area than as we have been doing. Uh, so Dr. Chauhan, we're so grateful to you for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Simji, tell to Dr. Sivan Murthy, he should make a brief note to Dr. Sivan, the yes. chairman of ISRO, Yes. And Satish Reddy. Yes. And also uh, PSA yes. and NSA right. about this because they are very much interested in what we, new things we are doing. And I right. think this is a thing they will be very glad to read. So, Silva yes. will write on Monday yes. a letter to all of them briefing about this wonderful webinar. Great. We'll have it done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Siddharth, you can continue with the QA and as you see fit. Please go ahead, Siddharth. Hi. Immense gratitude to Founder President, sir. I am still very moved by all the words and the announcements. We have taken due note of all of those things and we'll be following up and keeping you posted towards that. And also Dr. Asim Chauhan, sir, for uh, continuing to guide us. 
Uh, what I will do in the interest of time, since we are uh, close to finishing, we will spend maybe five more minutes because the questions are not stopping, I'm seeing. But in the interest of everyone being online, perhaps we will take three more questions and then uh, we will uh, stop the recording. We'll end today's show. And, uh, and then if the students are online, they can continue to ask questions to Dr. Clark. Um, otherwise, we will uh, take them offline. So quickly, question for Dr. Jonathan Clark. What role has the magnetic field played in the evolution, origin and evolution of life on Earth? Uh, how does that uh, affect our chances of finding life on Mars? Uh, right, that's, um, that's a very, uh, very good question. And um, we don't know uh, the answer. Uh, I mean, the Earth's magnetic field um, channels, but traps space radiation and channels some of it to the, to the poles, which is why we get the northern and the southern lights. And um, some people here would have seen those. The atmosphere also, our atmosphere also provides an enormous amount of protection against uh, the atmosphere. In fact, most of the protection against uh, space radiation. Uh, so the absence of a magnetic field on Mars today probably isn't a big hindrance to particularly to bacterial life and maybe living you know, just beneath the surface. Uh, so, for example, uh, we know the radiation at Gale Crater, where the Curiosity rover is, um, is about 254 um, millisieverts um, a year. It's a unit of radiation. Um, that's about the same amount of radiation that astronauts get inside the International Space Station. So it's high, uh, but it's not lethal. And in fact, there are places on Earth in Iran a place called Ramsar, which is a tourist resort, uh, where the background radiation level is about twice that. And there have been studies there that show there are no ill effects in the population, which is a bit surprising because you'd expect that to be the case. Um, there are places in southern India on the coast which have high levels of, of radiation. And there's a place in Brazil called Gurupari Beach, which is... Uh, is a huge tourist resort. Millions of people go there every year and it's got three times as much radiation as the surface of Mars. Uh, and, you know, people there look perfectly normal. Um, so, you know, high levels of radiation are obviously bad, but low levels are not as often not as bad as popularly thought. Um, early Mars, though, is an interesting question because early Mars did have a magnetic field. So early Mars had a magnetic field, early Earth had a magnetic field, and in many, many respects, <clears throat> pardon me, early Earth and early Mars were very similar, much more similar than they are now. So if a magnetic field is necessary for life to appear, then Mars certainly had it. So we don't know, but you know, an interesting question raises more interesting questions, some of which we can't yet answer. Thanks, John. Very quickly, next question comes from Devi Souza. Is there any evidence on salty water, even if it is frozen on Mars, like the oceans on Earth? Mm. Excellent question. Yes. Um, large areas of Mars are underlain by ice. Uh, we can see this. There was a spacecraft uh, back in 2007. Let me just shut this curtain. Sun was sun was getting my eyes. Um, called Phoenix, it landed up in the Martian Arctic, um, and it found ice about this far, a few centimeters below the surface. There had been small meteorite craters formed on Mars in the period the spacecraft had been observing the surface, where you can see ice within a meter or so of the surface. The instruments have mapped the amount of hydrogen in the top meter of Mars, and we know that about half of Mars has ice within a meter of the surface. And there's evidence in other places of ice much deeper, um, you know, 10 meters or five meters below the surface. So, yes, there, there's certainly water ice in many, many places. 
we know from spectral data that there are a range of salts in the soil of Mars. Um, certainly sulfate salts are very easy to detect. So things like um, magnesium sulfate salts, calcium sulfate salts, um, aluminium sulfate salts. Um, chlorides are a bit harder to detect um, with, with, with remote sensing, uh, but there is some evidence that, that they are there as well. Uh, we know from the Phoenix mission I mentioned earlier, there are these weird uh, salts called perchlorates, which are also present on Mars. And um, when you add them to ice, they tend to melt the ice down to about six, minus 60 degrees. Just like if you add table salt to ice, you know, that melts that down. Um, and uh, so we know there is salty water on Mars. We do know there's salts in the soil. And also we know there's fresh ice as well. So we've got all sorts of goodies there um, to study. Thanks, John. So we will take one last question, John, and request your answer towards that. Before that, I'll point out that the students who have signed up for this course, we will be sending out information on the first assessment task as well. Uh, you all have to fill it in the form of a Google form, and it's a requirement for your completion of this course. So details will be on the Google Classroom. So those students who have not yet signed up for it, we'll be having your uh, registrations done as well after this talk. And uh, yes, so bringing to the last question for today, John, what role has electricity played in the rise of life on Earth? Hmm. Question from Lisa Marie Persaud. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's so many interesting questions coming out of this group. Uh, Sorry for a lot of them being a little outside your area, but- Oh, uh, look, I, I just take it up as I go along, <laughs> right? Um, uh, all chemistry involves transfer of electrons. So, all chemical reactions require, you know, either electrons being added or taken up uh, to form chemical bonds. Um, so all chemistry and therefore all life has a, an electrical uh, component. Um, in more complex animals like, like ourselves, you know, with nervous systems, the, tran the transmission of um, neural impulses occurs because of movement of ions, particularly potassium ions, you know, backwards and forwards. So, not electricity in the sense of wires and, uh, and so on, uh, but certainly uh, elect movement of electrons uh, around is, very, is essential for life as we understand it. Uh, in the early earth, before life, um, electrical discharges, lightning in the atmosphere may have created some of the compounds uh, that are necessary for life to exist. And people have done experiments, so they've got big jars full of the sort of gases that made up the early Earth atmosphere and put sparks discharges through them and these compounds are formed. Um, so there's, there's a role there as well. Thank you very much, John. And uh, some of these topics are, of course, outside geology. I'm really delighted the way you're able to actually bring everything together and present it to the audience. So thank you very much for that. With this, uh, I would take the opportunity to close our first session. I am extremely, extremely moved and delighted by the response I'm receiving both from the higher leadership as well as from the students. And it gives me more motivation to keep moving on. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jonathan Clark for your time. I would also like to thank uh, Lieutenant General VK Sharma sir, who's been with us uh, throughout the session. Thank you very much for opening the session alongside me and for your guidance. Dr. Asim Chohanji cannot say enough. Thank you so much for all the guidance, uh, for all the work and the support that you're giving us. And uh, last but not least, of course, our honorable founder president, Sir Dr. Ashok Chauhan, uh, who's leading us and guiding us and uh, taking us forward as we establish astrobiology education and research in this country. Um, all the other teaching assistants and uh, class instructors who have been with us, thank you again for all of your time, for joining in across time zones with us. Uh, we end this first session with a